Hello everyone. Today, I will be talking about how to be versatile with data as a product manager. As a PM, we constantly have to make decisions in our various roles, and we have to make the right call very quickly and sometimes under ambiguous circumstances. So I wanna focus this talk on the various tactics you can use to excel in making the right decisions and getting the results you need efficiently. The key points I want you to take away from this presentation are how to flex your skills in using data for making decisions in the various roles as a PM, identifying the various sources from where you can get data to make decisions, and understanding the various types of data you may have to handle and how to process them. A little bit about me. I have been at AWS as a product manager for the last three years. Currently, I'm in the machine learning team, and previously, I was in the Elastic Compute Cloud team. As you can imagine, at AWS, we rely heavily on data to make decisions, and being conversant in data analytics is key to being a successful product manager here. I'm also an alum from the University of Michigan Raw School of Business. And when I get time, I'd like to go out and take photographs. You can find me at a camera story where I mainly focus on landscape and nature photography. What you see behind is one of my images from a sunrise at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So let's look at why being versatile with data is important for a PM. This is because as the owner of a product, feature, or service, you're going to be at the center of interactions with marketing, sales, support, customers, engineering, UX team, and even your leadership and finance team. You're going to be asked to make decisions or talk to any one of these partners or stakeholders in your day-to-day -day activity. And to make these decisions, you're going to rely on one or more of them for your data needs. For example, one day you may be writing product requirement docs and write user stories based on data that you may have already gathered. Another day, you may be talking to customers, understanding the pain points and customer needs and trying to address them. You may be talking to finance to project uh, the growth of your business or convincing leadership that they actually need to support this product or help make a decision. In all these different roles, you're gonna be wearing different hats. And for each of them, you're gonna to have to make decisions. And for each of these roles, you're gonna be handling it in different ways. A second reason is that you have to handle data from different sources as part of your decision making. Sometimes you may be looking at raw data, say from a log file or from a you know sales transaction. Other times you may be looking at dashboards to help support your case. You know, think uh, performance dashboards or charts uh, that show growth of your product. Uh, you may be evaluating soft data. These are things like customer interviews, surveys, feedbacks, and focus groups. Sometimes I even had to create data from social media and from marketing campaigns. And as a PM, you will often be asked to draw meaningful conclusions from all of these different sources of data and have to make a stand. So you have to quickly identify what makes sense for a given issue and evaluate which one to use to support your case. Another thing that you have to recognize as a PM is differentiating between qualitative and quantitative data. And this is an important distinction to make. Why? Because qualitative data is data that you can get from surveys and focus groups. And they help tell stories in a very different way compared to quantitative data, which you get from dashboards and data warehouses. And to be versatile with data, you may, you may need to distinguish one type of data from the other and to know and learn which one to use for each situation. And even after you've identified your data sources and categorized qualitative from quantitative data, you may still have your work cut out for you. And that is in using data to get the research you need. Sometimes it may be as simple as just pulling data from a table and creating a chart out of it, say, you know, growth of a project or sales data. But other times it may be a lot more involved. 
you know, maybe you have to transform your original problem statement into something that fits the data that you have. Or you have to convert data from one form to another using various tools like Excel or Python or even the other data management tools. And sometimes you have to combine artfully uh, combine qualitative and quantitative data and tell a story with it. And we have to do all this without the help of a data engineer. It's not the end of the world, but it's not an easy process. And that's why you have to be resourceful and inventive to handle such situations and be scrappy, that is be gritty and persistent to make sure that you take it all the way to the decision that you're trying to make. So we have looked at why, but before we go down the rabbit hole of what we need to do to be versatile, let's look at how we can frame the problems so that we can use data to solve those issues. Thankfully, this is a familiar concept and called the scientific method. And the base of basics of this is hypothesis testing. You first have to formulate the problem statement uh, that you want, that you have to make the decision for. And once you have formulated that problem statement, you derive the hypothesis that will help you make the decision. It will be clearer once I define or once I give an example. Uh, the final thing is that you have to know what metrics to track that will allow you to test that hypothesis and then eventually make a decision. So, for example, let's say you have to update a design element for a website. For example, it's where the search bar is located on a website. Uh, so to decide whether or not to do it, you would create a hypothesis test that tests whether updating that uh, search bar's location would improve, say, for example, the traffic to that website. And now that you've identified the hypothesis and the, and the metric, uh, then you go about doing what is called the A-B testing. And A-B testing is really just comparing that, that metric, that traffic of that website uh, for that updated design where the search bar has been moved to the original design in a very randomized manner. So it means that some customers, some users of that website are going to be shown the original design, whereas others are going to be shown the new design. And by running this across hundreds of thousands of users, you now have meaningful data that will tell you whether or not uh, changing the design improved at the traffic by say 20%. And if that was your hypothesis, you can say that, yes, this hypothesis was a valid hypothesis and you can go about with making that change permanent. The primary challenge that you will face, however, in, in that hypothesis testing, is that it's not always easy to transform that problem statement into a hypothesis that you can test. Additionally, defining the correct metrics for success is not always easy. In the previous example, you know, it was easy to just say it was you know, the traffic to the website. Other times it may be a bit more nuanced than that. And finally, uh, you may not always know the world of available metrics or data that you may have to look at. And this is where, you know, uh, looking at uh, previous examples of such changes or talking to your data engineering team to see what is available is very helpful. I would highly recommend a, a, a webinar from the product school by a PM, uh, Soheb Thia, uh, who, who gave this excellent presentation on how to be a data-driven PM. It breaks down this process of hypothesis testing in a very clear manner. Now let's look at an example of data gathering uh, that, uh, I, uh, that I did as a PM. I was working on, on a marketing campaign uh, for a new product that I had launched. And we wanted to do an email campaign to help grow the product. Now, typically, these kind of campaigns are run in a bulk operation where you know, thousands of customers are emailed uh, uh, information about this new product. And, and then uh, we have analytics teams to gauge uh, how effective that campaign was and what the success rate was. For this campaign, we faced an issue. We really couldn't do uh, email customers in bulk. This was because we had a very limited budget for running the campaign. Secondly, our customers were very sensitive to the campaign. These are enterprise customers, and if the email wasn't relevant to their use case, it's likely that they might unsubscribe, um, as we all do when we get irrelevant emails. 
The problem is this could impact future campaigns for products that are relevant to their use case. So the hypothesis is formulated to address this was that running a targeted campaign improves the efficacy of the campaign by a specific amount, and that is better than the cost incurred in creating this targeted campaign. The metrics that we track were the usual ones for gauging effectiveness of email campaigns, such as click-through rate, conversion rate. But in addition, I also wanted to track the growth and usage of this product by the targeted customer. So the way this testing was accomplished was firstly identified a select group of customers by using uh, data uh, about existing uh, products uh, and, and figuring figuring out like who these customers would be. So once we identified the customers, we ran a targeted email campaign to them. The control was a set of random customer accounts who were not using the similar product. After this was done, the marketing analytics team measured the email campaign metrics and these were you know, click through rates and conversion rates. But in addition, I also measured the growth and usage of the product uh, using our internal dashboards, roughly uh, two weeks and one month after the campaign was run, and compared, uh, compared the target customers against the control. What I noted was that there was a marked usage improvement in the targeted customers versus the non-targeted customers a month after the email was received. A hypothesis was on, on 30 days or a month was that it took that long for customers to really digest the campaign email and uh, you know, run a proof of concept uh, with the new product and decide that yes, the new product was worth, uh, migrating to the new product was worth the effort involved uh, in, in doing it. What, uh, as a result, like the, this targeted campaign improved the product adoption and it became a prototype for future email campaigns. So in summary, you know, we, uh, I was tasked with, uh, with growing the usage of a product and, and then ran a targeted email campaign uh, to, uh, to grow this product. Uh, and it had to be a targeted campaign because we had limited budget and uh, you know, we didn't want to spam customers. And uh, the end result was that by being scrappy and inventive and getting a targeted customer list and identifying the right metrics for usage, we were able to validate the hypothesis that they are running a targeted campaign and thus me, uh, you know, better the cost of running that campaign and improves the efficiency of such a campaign. So we looked at the why uh, we need to be versatile and how to frame a problem to be versatile. Let's look at what we need to be what we need to do in order to be versatile with data. If I start by revisiting an earlier slide that we did on distinguishing qualitative from quantitative data, we recognized earlier that this is an important distinction to me. And um, this is, let's put that in context of the hypothesis that uh, the testing that we are defined for making decisions. Based on how you frame your hypothesis, you get to decide what format of data you want to use to support that hypothesis. And this also determines your methods for collecting data and how you process the data. Now let's look at uh, examples of these two data types to really help you understand you know, what to look out for when you're looking at qualitative and uh, quantitative data and how they differ from each other. So qualitative data sources are really you know, descriptive and conceptual data collected through sources such as questionnaires, interviews, observations, and focus groups. They are needed when you want to tell a story from that, from, uh, from these uh, responses and customer insights. And because they are fewer in number, they usually point in time because they're collected, you know, during a focus group. You're not going to repeat a focus group every day. And additionally, because of that, the number of data points are likely to be fewer as well, especially when you compare it with quantitative data sources. I mean, how many times are you going to run uh, customer interviews? They're pretty taxing. The primary advantage of qualitative data is that insights really jump at you from these conversations. So you may have to do some work in integrating them. But uh, the challenge is that, or the flip side is that, it is much harder to avoid bias in gathering the data. You have to make sure that you know, you're not anchored one way or the other in, in gathering data. You know, uh, and, and as 
apart from you know focus groups and interviews, the other uh, key source of qualitative data are industry reports and market reports because they aggregate quantitative data into useful snippets and and this can really help tell a story or support your analysis. Uh, typically, your employer or your university is likely to have subscriptions to sources such as IBISWord, just some excellent market analysis reports. Let's look at quantitative data. Quantitative data should really be used when you're trying to quantify a problem based on data or when your hypothesis uh, requires you to measure changes in a numeric scale. Right away, this distinction is, you know, you can easily distinguish this from qualitative data. Um, and while this data can be point in time, it's more often than not. It is more often than not, it is not. It's continuous in time. And um, if you properly define your thresholds and constraints for collecting the data, you can make sure that you're avoiding bias or anchoring any of, you know, any, any sort of quantitative data. Of course, uh, because of the volume of data that you get uh, in this, the primary disadvantage is that you have to do some sort of processing or filtering to make sure you, you get the right insight from the data to help support or oppose your hypothesis. And this is especially important when you source data sets are huge. This can happen you know, if you're processing raw data from a bunch of uh, you know, IoT devices or if you're looking at audio files for for a particular, uh, you know, particular product, say an echo device. And you'll be lucky, you'll be lucky if you get access to dashboards that succinctly present that data, but more often than not, you have to do some analysis yourself. Notice that the one thing I didn't mention were customer surveys and feedback. And this is because this data source can be both qualitative and quantitative. It can be point in time or continuous because it all depends on how you formulate your questions and gather responses. Typically, if the responses are long form, you know, question and answer, it's going to be qualitative data. And again, you're not going to get a whole lot of responses uh, in, in long form. On the other hand, if your responses are multiple choice or you know, um, uh, sim simple options in things like a rating for a restaurant, then uh, you're going to be collecting data from probably hundreds and thousands of users and this becomes quantitative data and um, based on how you process or handle it you can also deal with bias in, in these situations so let's look at an example of dealing with uh, how, uh, dealing with both multiple data sources to help address an issue one of the products i was faced with uh, when uh, tasked with is working in a lab ec2 was to design a compute server for running a very specific workload. And this may seem arcane, but it's really as similar to like designing a specs for a laptop, which was for intended primary for like gaming or video editing. It's just that in this case, that the workloads and the customers are different. So the hypothesis I formulated was that a very specific design configuration is optimal for this workload. The challenge in testing that hypothesis was that you know, Design configuration isn't an exact science. There's nothing in literature says that you have to have uh, four CPUs and eight GB of memory, for example, to run this workload. And I had to rely on way too many data sources to eventually come to a conclusion. So in, in, formula, in formulating the product requirements doc, I actually had to look at multiple sources. The key amongst which was uh, talking to uh, customers. So I interviewed, multiple customers and ran focus groups. And these gave me qualitative input on uh, what it is to, uh, what customers are looking for for running this work too. It was few, but very valuable. I also talked to workload experts, workload experts for this particular workload, and, and they gave me even more precise input on what is needed. I didn't have the customer view, but you know, from a technical point of view, they helped me understand what was required. But I also wanted to validate these against uh, data that I collect in a non-biased manner. And so I looked at dashboards and usage metrics for similar workloads that I run internal to the company. I also looked at log files to see performance of, of the workloads in similar platforms. And using all of this together, I was able to create a product requirements document and, and then uh, justify the 
the, the specific configuration I was proposing uh, to leadership. So now we have looked at how you need to rely on different sources of uh, data uh, to make decisions. And so let's also look at why we need to be resourceful with handling data. This is because data is never in the format you need. Sometimes it's a large table or an Excel file. Other times it's just raw data. You know, I, I mentioned the IoT use case or it may be audio file. And if it is in these raw data formats, you need to transform it to the one that you need. Um, maybe a report or a dashboard or a chart. This is not intuitive all the time. And this is mainly because data sources can be pretty diverse, uh, especially raw data. And, and then there's no one single way to transform it into the format that you need. And if you, if you think of uh, audio files, the data is very different from sales transaction data. And you may need to combine all of this in order to meet your case. This is probably where uh, the help of a uh, business intelligence or a data engineering team can help. But what if you don't have such a team? What do you do? So let's look at a few uh, tricks or tactics that can help you uh, address those gaps. Uh, in you know, a typical medium or large enterprise, you're likely to have data in a data warehouse. And, and that means that you can, you know, it's in a database and you can write what is called SQL queries to extract the data that you need from it and then present it in a neat form. Uh, the problem is, you know, SQL is just going to give you a simple uh, table and you, you know, it's not in a presentable form. Uh, Tableau or, you know, some other form of graphical analysis tool is extremely useful in such situations because not only can you pull data from a data warehouse, you can also present it in a very uh, visual manner using graphs and charts. This is important because stories told with such visual dashboards are far more convincing and powerful in making your case, in making a decision, uh, in supporting your decision to leadership. But what if you don't have data in a data warehouse? Say it's in a log file, it's in a more unprocessed form. What do you do? I think uh, first and foremost, see if you can handle it with Excel. Uh, it's one of the most simplest tool, easy to pick up. And it has a little bit of flexibility in handling uh, unstructured data. But more often than not, if you have any form of tabular data, you can use, uh, you can import it into Excel and then process it. Now, initially, Excel is pretty extensible. You have, uh, you have pretty powerful BI tools that will allow you to make additional analysis. So if you're an Excel whiz, this is the path you should look at. On the other hand, if you have a bit more programming experience, uh, Python is certainly a better way to process raw data. And this is because even though, you know, it, it, even though there's a steep learning curve, once you pick it up, it has uh, a lot of power in how you can, how you can process data. It is very versatile and it, it, it builds upon uh, libraries and other uh, analysis that have been done by other, other people, other experts. You can also use tools like R, but really, unless you're a data scientist, it's probably not, it's an overkill for what you would need to do. So one thing to note is that all of these four tactics are repeatable. And that is key, because more often than not, you will be asked to redo analysis that led to the original decision. And, um, and you may need to do it multiple times. Now let's look at an example of how, uh, what we learned to fly. One of the tasks I was worked with, uh, one of the tasks I was working on was tracking the availability of specific products across different regions. And the goal was to uh, provide a roadmap uh, to our leadership on what to do next, where to expand the product needs. So typically, uh, in this case, I would have just looked at the dashboard maintained by our BI team. However, for this time, uh, there wasn't a dashboard. There wasn't even a data warehouse where I could pull this data reliably from. There was no hypothesis in this particular case. It was just a data gathering exercise, but we had to do it in a very quick and repeatable manner. So what I did was uh, did a bit of scripting with Python to check whether uh, you know this product uh, is launching in uh, every single instance in every single region, and by, uh, and then using the result from that Python script, I imported it into Excel to present it in a more human-friendly manner, you know, in a more graphical manner. 
And the key requirement was that it was repeatable because we had to know this every single week and present it to leadership. And so what the key takeaway for, for this is that, you know, you don't need to know every skill, but it's important to be resourceful and gathering the data and, you know, be very quick in processing the data uh, so that you, you're not stuck up on any specific aspect. And so, you know, the, the key takeaways from that exercise were how to be resourceful and you know, inventive with processing data and so that you're not hung up on very specific pathways or specific points. You know, ask for help if needed and make and be persistent in following through the to the results. There were times when I was beginning that exam with that exercise, I didn't even know what that end result was. Uh, but by pursuing it through the end and making sure that I had a repeatable result to be presented, uh, it, it was a successful venture. So we now reached the end of the presentation. Uh, we have now learned how to be a successful uh, data-driven team by being versatile with data. For this, the key take, uh, things to note are you need to know what your end goals are and what is the decision or hypothesis you're trying to make. Second thing is you have to be you have to learn to be flexible with where you get your data from and how resourceful and inventive you are in handling it. And finally, you have to make sure that the process you do for making these decisions is repeatable because you'll never know when you're asked to do it again. Thank you.